I welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to see you all here. Um, so I'm Katie from the customer success team and I'm gonna be your host today. Um, we're gonna be talking about finance operations and we'll be sharing three ways for you to save time and reduce manual tasks with Cladara. And I mean, who doesn't want to claw back some time? So the goal today is that you leave this session with some really practical takeaways that you can implement in your team. And uh, we're really excited to be joined today by Lou Ann Stain. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to have her here today. Um, Lou Ann is a fractional CFO. She's been working with Bowclips and Searchpilot. Um, she started her career in finance following quite a traditional path as a chartered accountant, but about 10 years ago took the, the very bold step into the world of startups and since then has worn many hats and has a wealth of experience that she'll be sharing with us today. So Thank you so much for joining. How are you today, Luan? I'm really good. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's going to be a long weekend in the UK and it's nearly Friday, so can't complain. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and also with me here today is my colleague and one of our amazing customer success managers, Juliana Cabeza. How are you today, Juli? Great. Thanks, Katie. I'm excited to dive into this topic. Yeah, me too. Me too. So before we get started, let me cover a few really quick housekeeping points. So uh, we are recording the session and we will be sending it out afterwards. Um, we have 30 minutes scheduled. And in just a moment, I will hand over to Huli and Luan for a fireside chat and a conversation about finance ops. Um, and then I will take over and we'll show you three ways uh, that you can save time using Cladara. And finally, I'm sure you've got loads of questions. So we want to make sure we leave plenty of time for that. So if you do have questions, please pop them in the Q&A. You should see that in Zoom. Start popping them in now and we'll make sure we leave some time at the end to address them. So that's it from me. I will now hand it over to Juli and Luan. Thanks, Katie. Um, hey, Luan. Um, to start us off, could you describe your role in FinOps and when talk a bit about what state a company should bring this role on board? Sure. So um, I'd say my role is pretty varied. Um, I wear the sort of hat of FD. I've been head of finance. Um, I feel like FinOps is something that's kind of come about in the past few years. Uh, it, it, it That doesn't mean it didn't exist before. I just feel like it's actually been given a name in the past few years. When I first started with um, startups and SMEs, you know, there was no real definition of what FinOps was. And we just had to sort of figure it out as we went along. Um, so I, I'm more of a finance generalist. I guess I can do everything from like fundraising to um, payroll to management accounts to um, implementing processes and systems. Um, so I think when you work in smaller businesses, you often have to wear all of those different hats, as you mentioned, Katie. And I think the time for this type of role is any time from when it from when a business is quite young, really. And it doesn't need to be someone senior necessarily. Um, I think it can be anyone in the business who is focused on improving processes and wants to work, you know, the typical smarter rather than harder. Um, it can be someone like the um, office manager or uh, maybe it's uh, if you work with an outsourced finance team or even someone in um, the HR or people team, uh, you don't need to have a dedicated finance resource to have a FinOps type of role. It, I think that role is really geared towards someone who loves um, improving processes and getting the organization working um, well, because I think FinOps sits very closely within the whole organization. So it's not necessarily just a typical finance or accountant type of role. Yeah, that's great. Um, Luan, tell me, how do you work and interact with other teams? Uh, so in the companies that I've generally worked with, um, our teams have been quite autonomous and we like to make sure that um, our teams can just kind of get on with things and that as a finance team, we don't sort of create, we're not the gatekeeper necessarily. We like to, you know, keep tabs of what they're doing and, and have good communication flows. Um, but we like to make sure that they can just get on with their jobs and don't feel like we're creating blockers, which maybe in the past I have felt before where, where people feel like they have to come to finance to ask for permission for anything. And I, I feel that um, teams actually work a lot better when they can just get on with things and they know what, maybe know what their budget is. They'll have the tools um, to equip them 
to get on with things. And they can also ask you questions and come to you if things aren't working for them. I think, um, you know, as a finance team, sometimes you make decisions and you roll things out. Uh, maybe the training's not that great or whatever, but I think understanding what your team's needs are and what their challenges are to keep their uh, roles working well is, is really important. Speaking of tools, when would you say is the best time to get a tool? Um, how do you choose it and how do you build a business case for it? Um, I think the minute that something is starting to annoy you or frustrate you on you know almost a daily basis, the minute you're starting to tear your hair out and you just think, oh, I really wish I could do this differently, but maybe you feel a bit overwhelmed because of the workload that this problem is creating and you, you sort of between a rock and a hard place sort of whether to stop and actually do something about it or just carry on, um, you know, suffering that pain. I think that's a, that's a good indication of, of when you might want to look at a tool. Um, the minute you start uh, building your own systems, you know, maybe you've got like a G sheet to manage um, the credit card transactions to hunt down the receipts. Like the minute you're starting to create your own tools, that's often like a, a warning signal that maybe there's something better out there. Um, we've also spoken about you know, how finance teams often put themselves at the back of the queue when it comes to um, building their tech stack. And I think that can really come back to bite you. And I think by, you know, putting, putting, uh, taking a blank piece of paper and saying, how much time are we actually spending on this? How much pain is it causing us as a finance team? And how much time is it causing our, you know, bigger team, the other, the other teams that are, are trying to pay for things and get their subscriptions sorted? Like how much is it actually costing them? And that you very quickly build a business case then, you know, to actually work out that whatever a few hundred pounds or dollars or euros or whatever um, that you're going to invest in your team for the month is actually pales in comparison to the amount of frustration as well as cost, you know, whether that's people's time or, you know, money lost on subscriptions that you haven't cancelled in time or, um, yeah, they're, they're, you can lose money in, in quite a few different ways. <laughs> And from your or from your own experience, how did you manage change management in our organization? Um, I think you know, typical accountant. It's it's always good to have a project plan, um, but it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be convoluted. I think uh, once you once you have that realization that something is a, is worth investigating further, you know, find a few options. Um, understand your organization's needs and your team members' needs because. What works for one organization may not necessarily work for someone else, or it might be that, um, that you know, similar tools might work, but you have very specific needs for your organization or your team members that you want to look into. So I would try and narrow it down to a few different options. And then once you're ready to go forward, you know, give yourself a deadline, um, give yourself a deadline to both make a decision and then also to roll the project out. And um you know, I think by giving yourself a deadline, it, it forces you to take action um, and then you don't get stuck necessarily in that whole analysis paralysis thing of, of trying to make sure that everything's perfect and that every everybody knows exactly how it's going to work. Um, set yourself that goal, set yourself the deadline, maybe roll it out with a couple of users just to see how it works, get people, you know, trialing the product um but but don't wait to start rather start and you can work the rest out as you go along um you know there's still we we use Cladara and there are still features that our team could be using and 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 I'm I mean I'm learning on the go as well I'm probably going to learn from this webinar about product features that we should implement so um you know don't let uh, I think often as accountants we want things to be perfect um, everything to work, you know, exactly by the book. Um, but I would actually say rather just get started and then you'll start to see the benefits of, of um, the change. Uh, and then it will free up time to then build in um, the other elements that maybe you didn't have time for to start with. And well, speaking of rolling out new processes, was there any resistance to new processes? Uh, did you face any challenge? Yeah, I mean, there's always, there's always, you know, people who are resistant to change. And um, I think often I try to take that sometimes as feedback on maybe how we've rolled out the change or maybe there's a gap in, in the resources that we've provided. 
um, you know, we try to have like internal, uh, like a wiki page where we write down all of our um, manuals of how things work and uh, refer people to um, to like help help articles from Cladara or we write some of our own help articles. So I think if if you're finding resistance or you're finding that things aren't working properly, I still have it. I've even had it this week. Um, then I sort of think to myself, okay, well, what haven't, what have I maybe not done properly, or maybe I need to, you know, make more time for the person, or just hop on a quick call, or um, maybe we need to have a lunch and learn, or maybe I just need to remind people, you know, it could be that there are people who are new to the organization, or there could be people who've taken on new responsibilities. Maybe they've moved to more senior roles in the team and inherited certain um, responsibilities managing software that they might not have had in the past. And sometimes you forget about that because you you rolled out the thing, you made it work, and then you sort of don't always get the time to come back and just recalibrate to see, okay, but hang on, when I rolled it out two years ago, was that person here? Did they get the training that I gave like two years ago? Um, so I think, yeah, it, it might. If you're getting friction and challenges, it might just be a time to reflect a little bit on um, what can you do to to overcome that challenge with the person or the team that that is causing it. Thanks, Luan. That was really interesting. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. So, what I'd like to do now is hand back over to Katie because we want to show you three ways you can improve processes and save your team um, time with the data. Over to you, Katie. Oh, thank you so much. Well, that was really interesting. I'm sure everyone got loads of insight from that. And uh, everyone, Luan's going to be staying with us for the Q&A. So do make sure you kind of drop any questions in there or share your own kind of uh, insights with us. Um, so yeah, as promised, I'd really like to take a moment now and share with you three ways that you can um, uh, save time with Cladara. I'm just going to share out my screen. Hopefully you're all looking at my transactions screen. I brought that up first because... Uh, the first one is a really quick win, and it's around invoice collection. Um, I'm sure there's many people here today who would like to reduce the amount of time they spend chasing invoices at the end of every month. And it's, uh, as I said, a real quick win. And so if we look at our transactions, you can see here, we'd love to see this invoice column with the green ticks all the way down, saying that all our invoices have been collected. Um, and I think this is a really great example of something Luanne spoke to about a, a tool kind of bringing efficiency um, and freeing up your time to maybe work on more in, impactful projects. Um, so how do we do this in Cladara? So this is uh, our automated invoice capture feature. And simply by connecting your inboxes to Cladara, we will automatically pick up your software, cloud hosting, advertising spend invoices, and attach them to the corresponding payment here in Cladara. Um, so if I dig down, so that's a nice green tick, but if I come into an application, say this is Metabase, here are all my payments for Metabase, and here's my invoice as a PDF. So you can also access and see it here. Um, Ham, so we said about connecting, in, uh, connecting your inboxes for our customers on the call today. You can do that by coming to your integration section and choosing the service that you use and simply connecting to that service. And then a really common question that we, we kind of get from our customers is, well, who should connect their inbox? Um, now, what we'd suggest is that anybody who is a software owner and receives an invoice should connect their inbox. Um, but most of our customers, I'm sure many of you today have a centralized inbox or are trying to at least kind of get people to send their invoices to a centralized inbox. So we'd suggest you connect that as well, that's possible. So we'd say do both and then you're covering both bases. Um, now, we do know that there are a, a couple of tools out there that don't send their invoices. There are not many, but there are a few. So I'll just help you with that as well. So what uh, happens after seven days if um, a payment has taken place and there's no invoice uploaded? The application owner will get a message from Cladara to say, hey, you're missing an invoice. Now, I've been really good and uploaded all mine, but anyone who hasn't would come to my tasks and they'd see their missing invoices here. So that's another way that Cladara is going to help you with a little bit with the chasing as well. Um, just just going to speak to a point, Luan, that you brought up about um, documenting, documenting the steps. <clears throat> as you can see here, it's quite simple to do that. So as new people join your company, invite them to join Cladara and get them to take these steps. And in terms of like a business case, I think this is 
the kind of fairly low hanging fruit as well. So excuse me. Um, in terms of invoice chasing takes an awful lot of time. So you can really quickly kind of say we spent X amount of time doing this, doing this task, how much maybe kind of someone's salary per hour is and what you'd expect to achieve if you if you change that. So this is kind of a quick win. Perfect. OK, so that was number one, invoice capture. So number two is still around accounting um, and saving time by streamlining how you get your kind of information, all that transaction information that you saw out of Cladara and into your accounting tool. So if we stay on the integrations page, we do have native integrations with Xero, QuickBooks and NetSuite. So if you use one of those tools, you can integrate directly to those. Without going to like too much detail how each integration works, essentially we're gonna push that transaction information straight to the tool. Um, so if you look here on this account, we have QuickBooks connected. So your application will have its own QuickBooks settings or zero or NetSuite. And you're essentially gonna map this application here in Cladara to the vendor, there's various different names and different tools, but to the vendor in that tool. So when that payment happens, we're gonna push that information over. And this pairs nicely with invoice capture because if the invoice is in Cladara, we're gonna send that over as well and attach it to the transaction. If you don't use one of those tools, don't worry, we can still streamline your process. You're just gonna come here and look at and use this accounting tab here. Now we've created the two most common code, um, code GL code and cost center. So you fill those in and you've got flexibility. You've got five other fields that you can create yourself. So there are additional codes that you need to upload to your tool. You can create them here. So once the payment takes place, all that information is gonna be included in the export of your CSV. So you'll come here at the end of the month, export that CSV, and all those additional codes will be here for you. Okay, so that was number two. So the third tip that we have for you today to save time is actually about establishing kind of an easy to follow procurement process for software. So everybody in the company knows that if I need something new, this is what I do. And this should help take some tasks off of finance's plate, kind of Luan, you spoke to this, kind of making people a little bit more autonomous. So finance has oversight, but is not necessarily having to take the actions. So I'm just gonna walk you through how there's kind of four steps to, to approach that here in Cladara. So if you think probably a lot of procurement or new tools kind of starts within the teams themselves, thinking about their own kind of KPIs, their own objectives and how tools can help them achieve that. Um, so that's kind of, I always pick on the sales team as my example, let's pick on the sales team. Let's say the sales team would like to kind of bring on a new tool, a new tool that's gonna help us reach out to more prospects and increase sales, something very kind of clear ROI. The kind of sales manager can come into Cladara and just kind of get an understanding of what their current situation is. They can come to the Teams page here and see their current stack. So this will stop them duplicating tools. This will help them understand, is there something we need to cancel that we're replacing this with? And if you're budgeting at a team level, you can even set that budget and they can see how they're tracking towards their budget. So that just kind of helps them have that awareness and have that conversation around whether they've got the budget or whether they need to engage with finance to talk about any extra budget. And of course, at the bottom here, nice historical spend for them as well. So they can start here and get that overview. But let's say that, great, they've got the budget and they can buy this tool. What would the next step be? Step two would be that person can come in to the applications view and start adding a new application. Now, many of our customers on the call today will know this very well. So I'll run through it very quickly. Let's say you want to add a tool, you have a reason why you need this tool and you assign it to a team. You enter the budget and how often you will need to be paying for that tool. And you're gonna request a virtual card. Remember, this is gonna give you one unique virtual card that you'll use to pay for this software. Depending on the tool or the, the product you're using, you'll have fixed or soft. Um, I won't go into too much detail, I'll essentially create a hard limit or have some flexibility. So let's choose the fixed for this example. And then what I'd like to show you is these compliance requirements. So this is part of our compliance uh, module. Um, but this is really great for those customers who are kind of SOC 2, ISO 27001, or kind of looking to get compliant. 
Um, and this is also where you can start collaborating with other teams. So another team who has to be involved in software procurement is IT, right? Or compliance infosec, depending on your company. So this is a really great opportunity to ask some additional questions about the software they're bringing on. We've added some standard ones here, but you can customize that. Um, and yeah, just make sure that all the boxes are ticked already in this uh, part of the process. So once all this has been filled out, the requester can hit that add application button. And when they hit add application, that will kick off step three, which is your approval flow. Now in Clodara, we offer two levels of, of uh, approval. So let's say the first level, and this is under the preferences where you'd come set it up. So let's say the first level approval may be, depending on your team size, might be, might be finance. They might actually, yes, have the sign off on budget. Um, if you're a site larger, it might be the team manager. So you can set that up. So team manager is actually kind of the first level approver. And then if you need be, you can actually set up a dedicated second level approver. Now that might be that IT person, compliance, or just the person who has to have the final say on whether this uh, software gets, gets purchased. So once those approvals are done, that's step three, we'll move on to step four, which is the, the final step. Uh, so once approved, the uh, requester becomes the application owner. So you've got that clarity over who owns this software, who's responsible for it. Um, and they'll also be able to securely access the card to pay for it as well. So it's quite a simple process, four steps. Uh, again, kind of Pudar has got help center materials, so there's no need to reinvent, reinvent the wheel. You know, we can provide some help there if you're rolling that out, but it's as simple as documenting that, putting it in your employee handbook, Notion, SharePoint, wherever you your employees go for processes. And then everybody knows that when I need software, this is what I do. And that's it. There's, there's your three ways to save time. I'm, I'm conscious of time myself, so I know we want to get to, to the Q&A. So I will end <clears throat> the demo there. And Huli, I'll hand back over to you. Thank you, Katie. That was an amazing presentation. Um, our first question is from Marta. Marta says uh, she's been hit by a yearly renewal that no one had on their radar. Any tip for staying on top of renewals? Um, yes, Marta, great news. You can schedule a renewal reminder in Pledara. Uh, we were actually talking about it with Juan before getting on the webinar, so it's a very relevant topic. Um, Katie, do you want to take that one and show everyone how to set that up? Yeah, of course. Let me share my screen back out with you all. Thank you for that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we were just talking about this, and I think uh, there's probably many a customer here on the call today who has been uh, blindsided by a yearly renewal. So in each application, you can set up a renewal reminder. Um, you just come into the application. Under subscription details, you come to edit, and you turn the reminder on. Right. So you set the date that you want to be reminded on. I'd say as a best practice, at least 60 days, kind of depending on the software and the contract, you might even want to go 90 days, right? That's normally when the renewal processes start. And you might need to give some kind of lead time if you don't want to use that tool anymore. So uh, definitely uh, set that 60 to 90 days before the renewal. You set how often you want that to go out. You can bring in different recipients. So that might be kind of whoever is um, a decision maker, the head of that department, finance. Those, those key people we're talking about before could be pulled in. And, and you can type a type a message here, <laughs> maybe elaborate a little bit more than I've put in here. But that's yeah, how you'd set up a renewal reminder and get ahead of those uh, large uh, yearly payments. Great, thanks, Katie. Okay, our second question: uh, budget change. Uh, some tools charge per seat or usage. How should you approach or manage that? Um, Luan, how do you feel um, helping us answering this question? Um, I think, you know, it's quite important to have uh, your tools almost as part of your onboarding and offboarding process. Um, I think it's probably a feature that we could still implement <laughs> on our side, but um, I've been really impressed by Clodara's ability to have that um, user number per, per seat in the request through Clodara. So then when somebody leaves, if you have that as part of your, say, offboarding process where you know that you have to review their Clodara subscriptions and either hand them over to somebody else um, and possibly renew the ones that they were owning, 
and then also renew uh, maybe the ones that they were part of. You know, some subscriptions flex automatically, like say Slack will, will automatically stop charging you, but others don't. And it, it can end up costing you quite a bit. So our team is quite vigilant with that. And we know, um, you know, to, to, to manage that and monitor when people join or leave and add them to things, but it, it can fall under the radar. So I think reviewing reviewing your Clazara um, or whichever subscriptions you have, uh, reviewing it on a regular basis and um, making sure that your your seat usage uh, is adequate to the number of team members that you have is is quite an important checkpoint to have um, whether whether you use a tool or not and uh, we we do it within our finance team but I also really encourage our say engineering and revops team um, to make sure that they're doing it on their side so that we don't get caught out good um okay um Speaking of that one, um, I wanted to mention that we'll be sending to all of our attendees a rollout plan with templates so that everybody can copy and paste into their employee handbook or notion page. Um, of course, you have us in the success team to advise you and provide training and resources to help you out, uh, roll out your data in the organization. Um, and yeah. Cool. Yeah. There's, um, there's one more question. Oh, sorry, go for it, Luan. No, I was just going to say, I actually learned something new about Clodara this week. I was telling I was telling you guys about where we had a bit of a surprise where someone, we, we got charged by something uh, unexpectedly. And I thought that maybe it was a renewal that we hadn't seen upcoming. Uh, but when I reached out to the, uh, the owner of the application, I realized that actually they had renegotiated the contract, but they just hadn't told us about the change. So they had taken action, but it, it you know, um, I then realized that we have the contract section in Clodara where they could actually have added the contract and added some notes. So I'm quite excited to um, add that feature to our contract management and, you know, the renewal section, because where we used to manage that all separately, I've realized now, you know, Clodara can actually be your one stop, really be your one stop uh, software management um, tool, not just the actual virtual cards, which is super useful. Perfect. Yeah, that, actually, that's you covered just one of the questions that came in from somebody about kind of adding contracts for different SAS term uh, items in the application tab. Um, so yes, that is that is totally possible as you as you said. So fantastic. Um, and we have had one other question come in, which I think is a really great one as well. I think we've got time for just one more. Um, how about? Uh, this one here, um, someone said they're working in a startup where we're reaching the point where our process is becoming more streamlined. How do we balance making sure we can be as efficient as possible while still keeping the human aspect of communication between employees? Well, that's quite interesting. Yeah, that is a good one. I think, it, it, you know, especially now with our more remote working, it can be quite easy to hide behind like emails and Slack, not hide, but, you know, I think it's really good sometimes to put a face to a name. So, um, I think making yourself or your team a bit more available in face-to-face -face, um, type of Q&As, you may find that there's not much uptake, but I think it's worth offering that up. Um, or if you have like an all hands or, you know, regular team meetups, like ask if if the finance team or the, whoever's in charge of FinOps can have um, a little slot to maybe add a new thing that they've learned or I think it really helps to put that personal touch in um, rather than just making everything like process driven and, you know, having every, everything written up in notes and emails and automatic, you know, reminders and all, all the rest. I think having that personal touch um, really does help, help you come, um, overcome some of the challenges sometimes and, and also increases your adoption. Um, I think by our conversations that we've had with our team, it's really helped to help the team to adopt the tool because they've just felt like it's something that we're doing for their benefit as well as ours. Um, yeah. Perfect. All that's left for me to say is to thank you, Luan, for joining us today and for sharing that. I think everyone agrees that's been a really insightful conversation. So thank you very much. Uh, of course, thank you to Huli as well. And thank you all for joining. So uh, if you've got any questions or you want to talk a little bit more about how Cladara can work in your organization, you can reach out to us at success at Cladara.com and have a great rest of the day, everyone. Enjoy that long weekend if you're in the UK. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.